But one morning, when I was um, taking some time with my Lord, um, I had this conversation with him in my imagination. Good morning, God. This is Margaret. Well, good morning, Margaret. It's nice to have you here this morning. I've got some exciting news for you. I have decided what I want to do with my life. I want to make sure everybody in Willits knows about you, and I want to go on mission trips and tell people how to live. And God said, oh, okay. I have a little, something a little different plan for you, but okay. Um, well, 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 do you want me to take, have an interview on the local radio station? And you want me to write articles for the Willis Weekly? Uh, no, that's not quite what I had in mind for you either. I think what I would like you to do is next week at the fellowship dinner, I want you to find that person who's sitting all alone and um, looks a little lonely and uh, sit with them and eat with them, talk to them. And I want you to find that person who looks sad or, or lonely or depressed and talk to them and ask if you can pray with them. But, but God, what about the interviews? What about the, the articles? That's so important. Uh, I, I picture God with a smile saying, well, Margaret, think about it a little. You know, and I did think about it a little. And I realized that what I was thinking of was about the big picture. All these things I wanted to happen, but I was forgetting the small part. I was forgetting the relationship part. I was forgetting to look around to see those who needed something that I could give. And I didn't have to write articles, and I didn't have to give interviews, thank goodness. And I didn't have to go on mission trips, although I love mission trips. I could just take care of stuff here in Willits. And that's what really I think is important, is how we handle our relationships with each other, and how much each other knows we love each other. Well, there was a professor who was an avid hiker, and he knew four languages. And, well, he thought he knew everything, but that's another story. Um, and he, so he was going to climb a, a mountain on every continent. And so he decided he was going to climb Mount Fujiyama. So he got his gear on, and trust me, it was high-end gear. And he got his everything on, and he just was good to go. And so in the morning, he got up, and he started to walk up Mount Fujiyama. Well, it was a little steeper than he thought, but, you know, he, I'm okay, I'm good. And then he came to where the trail split, and one went that way, and one went this way. Now remember, he thought he could, he, he could speak four languages. Well, Japanese wasn't one of them, but that didn't bother him. Because he said the sign was sure, it said, go this way. And so he said, okay, fine, I can figure that out, and he went that way. And about, oh, maybe a half hour down the trail, he slipped, he fell over the edge, and he died. Now the sign really said, beware, don't go on this trail. But he thought he had the answer. He thought he knew enough that he could go on the road and he would be fine. You know, and signs are all around us. I, some signs are spectacular. I mean, I love the clove versus clover milk, you know, the uh, moon, and moon over the moon and all that stuff. It's one of my favorites. Every time I see them, I love them. Some signs don't make any sense. Like there's one in Santa Rosa that talks about a hospital but gives no address. I'm going to find a hospital. How am I going to find it? Because you don't put an address on the sign. And then some are just disgusting. They're just like, I have to forget it. But there is a sign that we all know, and it's big, and it's bold, and it says, no man comes to me, comes to the Father, except through me. And as long as we remember that sign, we're in, we're in a good path. But what happens if we think our sign is better than his sign? I mean, after all, I'm a Christian. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I know the Bible. I'm good. Do we forget that that sign tells us which road to be on? And we, when we forget that sign and we forget that road and we kind of wander to the left or to the right, Okay, the, we may fall off the cliff and die, like the professor on Mount Fujiyama. Well, that also reminded me of a backpacking trip that I was on with the Pathfinders and with them. And one rule of the backpacking trip is you always have a, a partner. You don't never hike by yourself. Well, my hike partner was the, the lead of the group. I mean, if I, at the end of life, end of time comes, I want to be with him. 
He can eat. He knows what to eat in the wilderness. He's got it all together. Okay, so he's my buddy, so I'm good to go. So in, that morning, you have to go up a place called Sandy Ridge, and it is exactly that. It's on the face of the mountain. It's hot. There's no water. The water you put in your canteen at the bottom is all going to last you all day. So you, you just are very careful with it. So we're climbing up Sandy Ridge, and I'm whining and complaining, as usual. And, um, and, and he, Robert is ahead of me. And I'm just, you know, I'm trying to keep up with him. He's like 20 years younger than me. And so I'm trying to keep up with him. And they've told me that, that I will know where I'm in the right place if I can see the lake down to the right of me. It's the Cut High Lake. And um, so I saw the lake. I said, oh, good. <laughs> I didn't see Robert. I couldn't figure out where he was. I thought, well, he must be ahead of me. So I kept on hiking up the trail. And I could still see the lake. And I kept on hiking, you still see the light, but all of a sudden I realized that the trail was going this way and I could no longer see the light. And I said, uh-oh, I think I'm in trouble. Now, the reason that I'm in trouble is Don and I has, have a rule that we each carry half of everything. So I had the tent poles, but didn't have the tent. Okay, I had half of the food, no water. He had the other half, I don't know about the water. And so I'm going, okay, what am I gonna do? Now, you're cool. You've been backpacking before. Uh, I have a whistle. So I get my whistle out and I blow and I blow and I blow and I blow and I realize that the echoing is just coming back at me. Nobody's going to hear my whistle. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to stay the night here. Oh, Lord, please no. I don't really want to do this. Okay, I know I've got to put my backpack way away from me so that if the bears come, they can have whatever they want, but not me. And I got out my sleeping bag and I thought, no, I remember something else that I was taught, and that was if you lose track of each other, go back to the last time you saw them. And I said, okay, that means they gotta go back to Sandy Ridge. So I start back. And by this time, I have no heels. The blisters have worn blisters, and then the blisters have popped. So I was hobbling along, and I'm going, okay, God, this is, this is, this is for you, because I don't know what I'm doing here. And I hear Don and Robert calling to me, and they say, turn around and go back. And I'm going, I'm not turning around and going back. So I kept on, I kept on looking along, and they found me. And what had happened was that Robert was so far ahead of me, he laid down and went to sleep. And I missed him. Because I, I never pay much attention. I'm either reading a book or I'm, you know, looking at the same thing, sort of oblivious. And what, they didn't know I was gone until they got down to the lake and I wasn't there. And they couldn't figure out where I was because I vanished. And so they said, we gotta go find her. So they got up to the, to the trail again. And there's a trail, the trail was this way, and one trail went this way, and that trail went that way. And Don said, well, I think she went up that trail. And Robert said, no, she didn't. Don says, well, how do you know that? It's because those are his shoe prints. He had memorized every shoe print of everyone in that group. And so Don said, okay, and they found me, and I spent the week sitting in the camp with, and hobbled out on the top of my shoes. But it was that sign that he paid attention to that saved me, because he knew which one was me. And do you, are you aware that God knows you before you were born? He knows every hair on your head, or lack of hair on your head in some cases. Um, he, he, knows, he knows everything about you. All you have to do is make the sign and read the directions. And don't try to put your signs on it. Don't try to say, okay, God, I'm ready for you. These are my four choices. Pick one. <laughs> that doesn't work. What you've got to do, even though you pray and you study and you ask advice, this is the hardest thing to do is give yourself over to the Lord. So you can listen to what he's saying and you can hear what he wants you to do. Because as long as you're putting self in front and what you want to do and how happy you'll be when this happens, and oh God, you know what I need. You know what you need, but God knows what you really need. And a lot of times what you really need, you have to go through some things. And it's going to be tough until you get where God wants you to be. Well, the woman we're going to meet today is an amazing woman who loved the Lord so much. When he gave her a challenge, she blinked about twice and said, 
Okay, Lord, I'm with you. And so if you're ready to suspend the leaf and go back in time, we're going to meet this adventurer in Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. I understand you've been talking about trusting in Jesus and then letting him lead you in your life. And um, by studying, by praying, and giving over to him that he will lead you where he wants you to be. Well, boy, I'm getting ahead of myself, though. Uh, my name is Nora Hays Haysmore Anderson. That's a mouthful. Well, I was born in 1869 and in a farm in Michigan. And my parents joined the Adventist church very, very early. And so I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist and we had worship and we studied the Bible and it, I really had a good, good childhood and I learned to trust. But when I turned 18, I turned to my mother and I said, Mother, I'm going to go to Battle Creek to college. No, I never been out of my farmhouse except maybe a little town, you know, in other words. And mom said, okay, that's what you want. So off I went to Battle Creek in the nursing program. And when I got there, I uh, met this, this dude. Now he, because I had asked, you know, I were some clubs on campus that I could join. And they said, well, yeah, there's a brand new one. It's called the Missionary um, College Missionary Band. And I thought, well, I'm kind of interested in missions. I've always kind of thought I could go on mission. So I joined. And the leader was this dude. Now, he was quite good, I must say. And we talked about the missions, and pretty soon we were dating. And um, we had, you know, talked about missions, and sometime in the future, we might have to go on a mission. Well, uh, Pastor Tripp came to the club one day and he said, Harry, um, would you like to go and be a missionary right now? And Harry goes, and he said, uh, uh, I'm supposed to graduate in three months. Uh, can I wait? No, just can't wait. We were given 1,200 acres of land to build a mission on it in St. Baldwin. I had to look at that one up so I didn't know where that was. It was in Africa, South Africa. And so he said, well, can you give me a couple of days? And so Elder Tripp said, sure, I'll come back in a couple of days. So two days later, he comes back. We're engaged because Harry said, if I'm going, you're going with me. <laughs> and I said, well, of course I am. You know, and so we said, okay, We'll go. But he said, I want to tell you what you're getting into. He said, the place where you're going, every village has a witch doctor. And the witch doctor is determined who lives and dies. And if you have twins, he will say that the twins need to be tossed out into the woods or thrown into the river for the crocodiles. If you have a baby and the tooth comes in in the bottom rather than the top first, you also will have to throw your baby away. And some of them take files and they file their front teeth into spikes. And some of them wear their hair up in, I think you call it a man bun, but it's on the top of their head, it's about three feet tall. And we looked at each other and Harry said, well, they need to know about Jesus' love too. And that was that. So we got married in October. And I was, I could finish my nursing program because it was not a BA like, like Harry's. And so I graduated and I started at PATH. I've never been out of Michigan and I'm going to Africa. <clears throat> what do I take? What am I pack? So I looked around and I said, well, there's going to be children. At least I hope so. So I'm going to buy a doll. So I went down to the store and I bought this little tiny doll about that big. But the cool thing about the doll was its eyes closed when you laid it down and it opened <coughs> and you picked it up. And that made a huge difference in Africa. And I said, I cannot not take my milk pitcher because that was a gift. And then I went to town and I bought black shoes and I bought black nylons so I could be meek and mild and, and you know, just, just so that I would be a revered. And uh, so I packed them and then I packed my clothes and I was ready to go. Now, Harry is another story. I mean, he's very, he's a very man. <coughs> Carpenter tools, copper plates, 
pocket holes, saw, uh, anything that might need it to build something. And I'm going, well, I didn't think about that. Well, anyway, okay, he's good. So we pack. All right. And um, we have to go from Battle Creek to New York City. And um, I'd never been in Michigan, and so that was so cool, you know, because everything was still home. So we get to New York City, and we have to board the U.S. ship New York. And so we packed our trunks, and we had one berth for the two of us with bunk beds and the trunks in this little tiny room. Well, I gotta tell you, it's the worst trip I can imagine. It was bad weather from the day we got on until the day we got to London. The trunk, when the waves would go like this, the trunks would slam against that wall. And then when the waves would go like this, the trunks would slam against that wall. So we finally just ended up because we didn't want to get killed by our trunks. Well, we landed in London. And I told him, oh, I am so glad to be on land. And I hope the next part of the trip is not as bad as that first one. So we kind of did a little sightseeing. And when it got time, we got onto the Rosalind Castle ship that we were going to go to Cape Town on. And I told Harry, oh, please don't let this trip. This one was much longer than that one because I don't know if I can stand another one. But it was a beautiful trip. God was so good to us. We could stand on the bow of the ship and we could look at the stars at night and know that they were the same stars that they were seeing at home and it, and it helped us a whole lot not to be so homesick. And when we landed in Cape Town, you know, I thought Cape Town was going to be like this, what the pastor trip, and the, you know, the hair and the fangs and the, you know, the witch doctors and all that stuff. And what I saw was a modern city. I was amazed. There were automobiles, there were tall buildings. And I thought, I wonder why they don't want us here. It looks like there would be lots of people. We can teach about God. And I kind of heard God whisper in my ear, uh -uh, not what I have meant for you. Just listen to me. So Harry and Pastor Tripp went to the train station to buy train tickets for the next part of our trip. Well, the train master said, you're going to go to the end of the line. That's 800 miles away. And the only stop that you're going to have is at the end of the line. Now, the train had three different sections. The, 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 the economy, no, not the economy, the no seats section. It just had benches that you sat on. And then the second section had what they called berths, which had bunk beds. And so they put the trips and us all in this one. And then if you were rich, you, got, you had a, you know, a, a good trip. Well, anyway, so we started out. 800 miles later, and several months later, we got to the end of the line. Harry and the, and, and the elder trip got off and went to get the ox carts that had been set aside for us. And when they paid for the ox carts, they found out that we had now spent all the money we had saved for the entire first year. And the ox cart dealer said, you know, have another 600 miles in an ox cart. I told Harry, you know, I'd rather walk. He said, I don't think so. I think you probably really want to get on the ox cart. So we loaded our trunks and we started off. And it was so hot that we decided what we need to do is we need to sleep during the day and drive at night. And so we would get up at sunset, drive till sunrise, excuse me, and then sleep during the day. And we did that for three months. Mm -hmm. And finally, we got where we were supposed to be. There was no water, very few trees, not even any grass. It's just like the Serengeti. It's just brown stuff. And we thought, okay, God, you sent us here. There's got to be a reason. So we pitched our tents, and Harry immediately started to cut down trees to build some kind of a shelter. We woke up the next morning and there was a man standing there staring at us. And we thought, huh, oh, okay. And he, and he couldn't speak our language and we couldn't speak his. So through much signing and, you know, doing all this stuff, we figured out he, want, he said, are you teachers? We looked at each other and he said, well, I guess we are now. Mm -hmm. And so we said, but there's no school. 
teach me. And he said, okay. So we went over to a tree and we sat down and we began to teach him. And we taught him arithmetic and we taught him Bible. And during the morning, he and Harry would go out and cut down trees. And by the end of the week, there were 10 guys there. By the end of the month, there were 40 guys there. So we had a school. We had no school, but we had a school. And it, but it worked out really well because in the morning they would all go and they work and cut down the trees and, and start to build bunks and beds and you know uh, desks and just whatever whatever was needed for the school. Well, I gotta be honest, the first year was awful. And I thought God sent us there, and I really began to wonder what he had in mind. First of all, we had brought seeds. And so Harry had planted and made a garden, and I had to walk several miles every single day and back for water, for us to drink, to wash with, and to water the plants. And the plants were just beginning to show vegetables, and we knew we were going to be all right, because we had been eating boxes of battle creek food, and those of you who know battle creek food, every meal for every day is really old. Anyway, so... The sky all of a sudden turns black, I mean, as black as night. And we heard this <sharp inhale> and we realized the locusts were coming through and they ate everything. There was nothing left. And I said, Harry, what are we going to do? I said, oh, we can replant the corn. I still have more seeds, but the beans are a total loss. So we ate very little that first year. And then the next thing that happened was there was a war going on and there was a famine in the land so we couldn't even get any food anywhere and then malaria struck and five of our missionary friends died three moved to the coast because they said they didn't want to live there with the mosquitoes and harry and i when we had bought the ox carts heard of a thing called quinine and we bought it and we never got the malaria but they, everybody else said it was too dangerous they were afraid to try it but we were okay. And so we survived that first year. Well, the next kind of thing that things happened is, is uh, Harry had planted orange trees and we had actually got some oranges by this time. And we woke up one morning again and there was another guy standing there and he said, I want an orange. And we said, we only have one orange. And then behind him stepped 10 other men. And he said, remember, there's a war going on. Okay, so he said, okay, God. And Harry said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you guys. Come back tomorrow, and I'll have something better for you than the orange. <clears throat> and so the next morning, when we got up, there they were standing right in front of us. So Harry got out his sack, took out his pocket knife, and he sliced that one single orange into ten slices, and he gave each one a slice. And I wish you could have seen their face. I wish I had a camera. Because they were just, they never tasted anything so wet and sweet. They were just, oh, they were just, you could tell, just they wanted more. And Harry reached into his bag and he brought out samplings of, samplings of the orange trees and he gave each one one. And he said, I'm going to give you your orange, your own orange tree. But you have to promise me that you'll plant it by ours and every day you'll come and you'll water it, you'll fertilize it. You'll weed it, you'll take care of it, and you'll have oranges also. But you know what else happened? While they were fertilizing and watering and weeding, Harry was teaching them about the scriptures. And they all became, they all became Adventists and loved the Lord. They loved the Lord. Well, Harry at this point decided, we've got to have water. We've got too many people around here with no water, and my wife cannot continue to carry the water for miles. So he wrote to the General Conference, which takes forever, and then asked for some, uh, some money to uh, build a well. And we got a thousand dollars. And so Harry said, yes, God, thank you. We can dear, drill a, a well. And so they did, and we had water. And then Harry says, you know what I'm gonna do for you? I am going to build you a mud house. And I thought, okay, it's a house. I'm good with that. So he builds this mud house. And my stove that Harry had purchased for me as a wedding present brought out, he brought it out and he put it in the kitchen. And I could now cook. 
I mean, I had a brand new stove. Oh, it was just, it was spectacular and I was so happy and I just thank God so much. And this, the word got out about this. And so pretty soon we had women who came to watch me cook and who came to watch me do my chores. And every day there were more women and I would bring the doll out, remember that doll? And I would bring it out and I would lay it down and his eyes would close. And then I would pick it up and his eyes would open and they were amazed. They thought it was some kind of something. You know, and they wanted to see that wall up and down, up and down, up and down. And one day, another lady came who had not been here before, and she kind of looked down and she said, Hey, everybody, she's black, just like us, only her face is white. And they were looking at my shoes and my socks, and I thought that was pretty funny. Well, not too long later, the rains came, and I woke up one morning, and I felt drips on my face. And I didn't even want to know what was going on, so I just pulled the covers up over my head and I kicked Harry and I said, Harry, this is not going well. Let's go see what's going on. So Harry gets out of bed and as soon as his feet hit the floor, he lands in sludge and mud and water. And he goes into the kitchen and he said, oh, Marty, you've got to come. My beautiful new stove was under eight inches of mud. Mm. We could not live in that mud house. It no longer existed. But God is good. God is good. Um, at this time, uh, we got to notice that Harry's father was sick. And so we decided that we would take a furlough and go back to the United States. And so we did. And we were in the States for, for six months. And um, Harry's father died, but Harry was really happy he was there. And we went to a lot of the churches around Battle Creek and we told about what's going on with the, the mission. And um, we got some money and we had to go back the same way we came with the ships and then the train. But the train went further, so it wasn't quite so bad this time on the ox carts. We got home and um, we felt really at home. And we had built the mission house by this point and we wanted to name it and we thought we're going to name it the Seleucy Mission and that name is very revered very revered and it means to be persistent and it was like God gave us that name even though it came from really Indonesia I have no idea how that got there and there were the members and we got another call from Elder Tripp, and he said, want to do it again? Want to go to build another mission? <laughs> and we felt we had been at Seleucid long enough and that we, we could do it, so said, we said yes. And so it was very hard for us to leave our mission house, to leave our members, and start over again. So we packed up our trunks, put them in the ox carts, and off we went. Now, Zambia, where we were told we were going to go, is a land that has a huge, huge amount of lions. I mean, they have more, they have more lions than any other country in South Africa. And so, Henry, being a man and all, and knows everything, he said, we, one night we were listening to these sounds, and he's other than hyenas. And the boys that we brought with us to help us start the building said, I, I, I don't, oh yeah, they're just hyenas. Don't worry about this hyenas. So, we went to bed, and we kind of form a circle, so we're kind of protected. And we had my daughter that was just very little at the time, and we had named her Naomi because of, for my mother. And uh, we went to sleep, prayed, asked God to keep us safe. And the, the oxen were really restless that night, and they were like chattering against the wagon tongue, and they were just, they were just, kind of freaking out and, and we couldn't figure out what it was but we knew we were safe and so we went to sleep. Well in the morning when the guys unhitched the oxen to let them go graze, they yelled back, teacher, 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 come, come, come. And we went and there all the way around us were lion traps <laughs> where they had walked around us and where we three were lying, they had, like, the lions had actually stopped and had looked at us and then went on. And we felt like Daniel must have felt in the lion's den. Because he saved us. We could have been dead that night 
and yet the lion didn't touch any of us. Well, we got to where we were going, and uh, oh, I gotta tell you, it was wonderful. We had running water, we had beautiful trees, we had grass, it was just, just the best. And it felt so good to be able to just sleep on the ground and not have to worry. Well, we started again. We got up in the morning. There was a man <laughs> by a tree. And he said, are you teachers? We said, well, yes, we are, actually. He said, I want to learn. He said, OK, because there's a tree. Let's go learn. And so we started by learning each other's languages. And by the end of that month, we had 60 men there, some who have walked 500 miles to be taught. And, and to become a Christian was we were just amazed. But because of so many people um, there and so many men there, we thought, well, you know what? We can we can do this quicker this time. And Harry looked at me and he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build you a real house. That was my dream come true, and I knew that I was truly in home. <coughs> and Africa was my home. I can't tell you how thankful I was for that. I learned so many lessons about my life. I learned that I have to spend time with the Lord every single day. If I don't, things do not go well. I learned that I have to trust in Him when things are bad, like the malaria or my ruined house, or no food, or war, or witch doctors, that I had to trust in him, that he had my back, and that he knew me from before I was born, and he knew that where I was going to be, and he had me sheltered in the hands of his hand. And I knew that my parents had given me a good foundation for all of this, which brought me to think about the parable that Jesus told his disciples and friends, and that was about a man who was a very smart man, and he wanted to build a new house. So he shopped around, he looked for the best land that he could find that was full of rocks, he went got the best wood that he could find and chopped it down, and he built very slowly and carefully his house. Well, a storm came one night, and the winds blew, and the rain just were just against the house, and the house was shaking, and he, inside and he said, oh, I hope my house stands. And when the storm stopped, he went out. And his house was as good as new. Nothing was wrong with it. Well, there was another dude in town who was in a hurry, and he too wanted to build a house. So he found the first lot that was for sale, and it happened to be on the same day, that no big deal. And he cut down whatever wood he could find, whatever trees, it didn't matter. And he kind of sloppily built his house together, and this storm came. And he went inside, and the wind blew, and the rain came down, and his house just sank. And Jesus said that our lives are like that. If we have a foundation built on the cornerstone, which is the cornerstone of Jesus Christ, then we will withstand any storm that God allows to happen to this earth. The devil will try to get us. He'll make our life miserable. He'll make us sick. He'll, he'll try everything he can to get you off of that foundation. But if your house is built strong and it's built on the Lord and you talk to him every single day and you believe that, you, that he will take care of you and he knows you personally, you will go through and you will be saved. It's only when we take the wrong trail, and it's only when we go what we think is the right way. You know, and, and I, when I think of a backpack, I, I think of all the things you pack in a backpack, and I'd like to ask you, what do you have in your backpack with you this morning? Do you have anger? Do you have jealousy? Do you have, do you have hate? Or do you have the love of Jesus? Because if you have the love of Jesus in your pack, and you toss all that other stuff out of there, you're going to make that down the road to when Jesus comes. 
So my challenge for you today is to fill your backpack with God's love. Know you are loved. Know all he asks of you is to be his child and let him talk to you and listen to what he has to say. That's all he asks. It's, it's pretty simple. But the hardest thing is to give yourself totally to the Lord. Let's, let's pray. Father, teach us how to come closer to you so that we can rely on your promise that you will equip us for whatever comes our way. We feel safe because you always keep your promises. We want to listen to you and do what you say. Please help us to be filled with your words and your presence this week. And bless us now as we leave your sanctuary and bring us back next Sabbath. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.